now we go to the third architect whose birthday um, was on the 31st of October, and that is uh, the well-known Zaha Hadid. I have several presentations on her, and it was a little bit difficult to choose which ones to show. Uh, and I have here, I will start with this one. I have another one with the new works done by her office, which is run now by Patrick Schumacher. But um, let's begin with this one where I show unbuilt works uh, and uh, some lesser known works. And, uh, you know, if I didn't choose uh, correctly, um, please forgive. So she was born on, on in, in 1950, uh, so 71 years ago, on the 31st of October. And uh, we all know about her. She was one of the most uh, uh, publicized uh, figures in architecture in, in recent times. I like this picture of Zaha Hadid, you know, it's, it's, uh, it shows clearly a, a very determined lady, you know, uh, a, serious, a serious fighter for the cause of architecture. And I admire her for this. It's not easy what she did at all. Uh, I could not have done it. She did it and she, what she did, uh, very few uh, architects uh, could have done. So, you know, even if one, one might not agree with everything she did, I think she, she represented and she represents a true force in architecture. And uh, her, her uh, total dedication to her cause, uh, you know, to, to what she believed in, totally remarkable, making no compromises. It was not easy and she did it. So let's read. Dame, because she became a dame, which is the equivalent of a sir, Zaha Mohammed Hadid uh, <clears throat> was born on 31st of October, was an Iraqi architect, artist, and designer, recognized as a major figure in architecture of the late 20th and early 21st centuries. Born in Baghdad, Iraq, Hadid studied mathematics as an undergraduate and then enrolled at the Architectural Association School of Architecture in London in 1972. In search for an alternative system to traditional architectural drawing and influenced by suprematism and the Russian avant-garde, particularly Kazimir Malevich, Hadid adopted painting as a design tool and abstraction as an investigative principle to quotation, reinvestigate the aborted and untested experiments of modernism to unveil new fields of building. She was described by the Guardian uh, in Great Britain as the queen of the curve, which is not quite correct because actually she has uh, projects uh, very angular uh, so uh, this is very simplistic and actually misleading, who liberated architectural geometry, giving it a whole new expressive identity. Her major works include the London Aquatic Center for the 2012 Olympics, the Broad Art Museum, Rome's Maxi Museum, and the Guangzhou Opera House. Some of her awards have been presented posthumously including the statuette for the 2017 Brit Awards. Several of her buildings were still under construction at the time of her death, including the Daxing International Airport in Beijing and the al Wakrah Stadium in Qatar, a venue for the 2022 FIFA World Cup. Hadid was the first woman to receive the Pritzker Architecture Prize in 2004, she received the UK's most prestigious architectural award, the Sterling Prize in 2010 and 2011. In 2012, she was made a dame by Elizabeth II for services to architecture. And in February 2016, the month preceding her death, 
she became the first woman to be individually awarded the Royal Gold Medal from the Royal Institute of British Architects. Well, we can only be impressed because uh, the truth of the matter is what, what, what this lady achieved in architecture is uh, almost unprecedented. Some early works, I will show some early works which are uh, less known. And I will begin with her first project which brought her a lot of attention because she won the, the first prize uh, for the, the Peak Leisure Club uh, from 1982 in Hong Kong. And we already see the tremendously new and vigorous and uh, almost wild architecture that she was promoting at the time. Uh, even the, the way she represented her project was, was unique. You know, who would have, who dare to, to present in, an, in a competition uh, this kind of uh, renderings? Uh, so this is her project here. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, yeah, she won the first prize. Again, again and again, if you take risks, you might lose. But if you don't take the risks, you lose for sure. Well, she took risks and she won. Here you see influences coming from suprematism and the Russian avant-garde. Uh, it's an abstract language. It's an abstract architectural language. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, unconventional uh, for that time and even for our time. But it worked. It worked for Zaha Hadid. You could say it was luck. I think it was more than luck. It was her determination because for 10 years, she didn't have commissions. She just took part in competitions. Next, we are going to see a project that she won with, and it was not built. So she had her, her share uh, of, of disappointments and defeats, but she never gave up. And this is in a way the, the, the recipe for success, never give up. Doesn't matter, you know, uh, society can be indifferent, can be uh, malevolent towards you, never give up if you believe in what you are doing. And she believed in what she did. So she won. She won the first, comp uh, the first uh, prize for this competition. And uh, I think there was joy in, in preparing these drawings. You know, these drawings were done manually. And you can tell, you know, they are, they are turbulent drawings. They are, you know, uh, from a conventional point of view, you would criticize them. You would say, wait a minute, you know, what is this? Well, what is this? Again, this is Hong Kong. This is the vision that she had uh, for her project. Or what is this? The whole world is fragmented. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, maddening in a way, but it's part of her vision, she had a vision. Now we, uh, we go to the second uh, project that I show from her early work. She won this competition again, but this was not built, nor the previous one, the Cardiff Bay Opera House. Uh, but but this, these projects paved the way for her later uh, projects, which began to be built. And, uh, you know, uh, again, if you, if, you, if, you, if you adopt such a stance in architecture, you have to go to the very end. There is, no, there is no room for compromise. And she didn't compromise. Okay, this was not built. Although she won the competition, uh, the previous one was not built. She won the competition, but... <laughs> She took her event. She built so many buildings that, you know, I, I, would, I would need 10 presentations in order to be able to pay justice to this uh, uh, phenomenon because she was a phenomenon. 
the Zahar Hadid. She was. There was a darkness in her vision, I would say, and um, I, I would not perhaps uh, say more about it and now, but uh, maybe it deserves a whole uh, distinct presentation just on the darkness or the dark side of Zaha Hadid. Although much of her work is rather white or whitish, but I think psychologically there is a darkness. There was a darkness in, in, in Zaha. I think if we can learn something from her is the value of passion. If you have passion and you work hard, if you persevere, maybe something will happen. It's not guaranteed. Of course, the complexity of life could, uh, could, uh, could uh, bring one to different results than the one she arrived at. But it is important to continue to trust in your instincts, in your vision, and to work hard, yes. Okay, so I'll show now incomplete, completed and a few unbuilt projects, rather unknown, most of them. I thought because her, her uh, oeuvre is so large, it's massive actually, and many projects had been published uh, extensively, I thought of showing some works which are a little bit less known, incomplete, some of them completed, and a few unbuilt projects. So we begin with this work in Melbourne, in Australia, which was not built, this tower. You know, again, she built a lot, but, but the body of her work is much more ample than her built work. And uh, just like in the case of Frank Lloyd Wright or Le Corbusier, who also had so much work that was not built. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright built more, but he himself did uh, more than 1,000 projects and only about 500 were built, I think. So again, the body of the work of, a, of an architect of their stature is huge. And, uh, you know, this tower could have been an interesting addition to the skyline of Melbourne, but was not built. Now, at the time when she did this project, she had a, a team of at least 400 people uh, working with her and for her. I mean, just one of these buildings, if you build one of these buildings that you see here, okay, uh, only this one was hers. But what I'm trying to say is if, if an architect builds just one tower like this, it would feel kind of accomplished. Well, she built many, as you know, many, many. Now the Mercury House Tower in St. Julian's in Malta, another tower that was not built but again, distinctive and uh, with some very interesting things going on here. Uh, again, we, we, you cannot do this kind of architecture with uh, conventional uh, manual means, it's impossible. You know, she has a department even now, I mean, now they have a research department within their office. About 20 people or so are just doing research. But when you have a team of more than 400 people, you can afford to, to pay the salaries uh, in British pounds to 20 people who just do research. They are pushing the frontiers of architecture. 
and they are doing it with vigor. There is a, the mundane aspect of her architecture, which uh, I, I have some troubles with. But you saw before Richard Morris Hunt, he also was working for an elite. Zaha Hadid was working for an elite. Um, I, I, wish, I wish she also worked you know, for more modest projects, you know, like social housing or something like this. She didn't. Now, a museum in Cagliari in Italy, which was, not, uh, which was not built at the time when I made this presentation, it was on hold, but it's very interesting and uh, I wish it will be built. Again, if an architect would do just this building, <laughs> you know, could uh, very well just uh, rest for the rest of his or her life. And this is one of hundreds of projects that she did and many of them built. It's not bad. I really wish this building would be built. The bizarre thing is, the strange thing is that she declared uh, that she wanted to build a raw R-A-W architecture, an earthy architecture, and a vital architecture. And I thought about this, uh, this, uh, uh, these three words, raw, earthy, vital. I actually don't think she achieved what she wanted to do. I don't think her, her architecture is raw, and I don't think her architecture is earthy. Her architecture might be vital, but it's not raw and it's not earthy. And this excessive whiteness, I think, is a deficiency. Uh, the, the, the interesting forms, the volumes, the organic qualities, they are fine. But this excessive whiteness and smoothness they are certainly not connected with what is raw and with what is earthy. And uh, who knows, maybe if she lived longer and it's said she died at 65, maybe she, could, she would have arrived at an architecture that maybe, I don't know, I didn't see, I didn't see too many uh, uh, you know, uh, signs that she was moving in, in that direction. But this building, uh, I wish it was built because it is interesting. Without the laboratory, the research laboratory and the extensive digital technology that they use, this could not have been even envisioned. Forget about, uh, you know, making uh, working drawings for it and building it. But again, this, this whiteness, excessive whiteness bothers me. I have seen a building by her in Vienna, uh, the library, um, you know, for a student's library. It's a large building. The interior very similar to what we look at here. Maybe it's a, here is a little bit more dramatic, but the same kind of architecture with smooth whiteness, and uh, you know, yes, uh, curves, and, but but a little bit for my taste too mundane and too predictably smooth and white.
Now, uh, for uh, Nicosia, Cyprus, the Freedom Square, uh, this was also not built. She obviously worked incessantly. I mean, to do so many projects, so many competitions, and to build so many buildings. Her life was totally dedicated to architecture. Now, the Esfera city center in Monterrey, Mexico, a uh, project which I don't think uh, uh, was built. I had a problem with this, this building, but uh, who knows, maybe I'm not right. Uh, it's, it's this, again, this mundane, you know, is, is this, this kind of uh, life that only a few can afford. Uh, I mean, here you, we, we see, you know, young people running and so on, but, uh, you know, they, these are expensive uh, housing units. And uh, as far as I know, she never addressed uh, the other side of life, so to speak. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's something that, who knows, maybe even affected her health. I'm tempted to think. Anyway. I mean, again, who, who can afford this kind of living room? You know, not just in Mexico, but uh, everywhere. Life seems to be indeed very nice, no? You know, people uh, jogging and, uh, you know, uh, coming from the pool and, uh, you know, running there on those machineries. No one works. <laughs> I guess certain people can do it. Anyway, the new century CTR center in China, in Chengdu, China, uh, we know, we know her architectural language is, uh, in a way, it's, uh, although she has a variety of, of projects, but there is uh, something about all of them that would say, would make you say, this is a Zaha Hadid project indeed. Although there are now archi other architects, including in China, who are kind of similarly with twisted, um, curvaceous uh, uh, forms and shapes and so on. I am surprised that she didn't question, she didn't seem to question this, you know, uh, continuously present uh, whiteness and smoothness. Now the Dominion Tower in Moscow, in Russia, which was built, um, it's not bad, but with the exception of this atrium, which is, uh, you know, like a vortex, Otherwise, the building towards the outside is rather, you know, not, not very special. I, I, I wouldn't say it's banal, but uh, you're going to see it. The, this is what, this is the center. The center seems to have some life in it. Otherwise, you see from, the, from afar uh, or from the exterior is rather, you know, a, a common building in a way. So, I mean, I know it's her birthday now. Maybe I shouldn't say anything negative. And I, I did this myself. Maybe that's why it bothers me a little. I think it's rather convenient and, and facile, this, this kind of, uh, you know, little diagonal that transforms uh, the, the taller windows into less tall windows. It's a little bit graphic and it's almost like a, a gimmick.
but this this interior space is um, although you know uh, precedents were in cincinnati in the, in the museum of contemporary art art and also in, at the maxi museum in uh, rome it's graphic it's um, it is dynamic and a little bit confusing and maybe she wanted that uh, but uh, at least here you have uh, whiteness and blackness it's not just whiteness although whiteness is still uh, significantly present I see there's still some kind of a vortex here uh, in this atrium, at the center of the building. I think if she had the courage to bring some impurity, some imperfection into these fluid uh, uh, systems, her architecture perhaps would have been uh, would have been a little more uh, interesting and complex and less graphic and less mundane maybe that's why Lebia Suds when he commented on the works of Lebia Suds of um, Zaha Hadid uh, she said he said that um, she compared her works with the works of Tzvi uh, Hacker uh, an architect in Israel uh, and uh, but born in Poland, like Daniel Lipskind, and and he questioned a little bit, and I think Lebiasud was right. Exactly this aspect of uh, the, the, the buildings of Zaha Hadid are, are are remarkable, but somehow they they don't connect with uh, with uh, with the city at large. You know, they are they are in a way self enclosed. They are perfect perfectly fluid systems or fluidly perfect systems. I can play with the words, but they are also a little bit too smooth and too clean and too, you can imagine the amount of work required to man, maintain so much whiteness. You know, it's, it's um... anyway, a bridge in New Taipei in Taiwan, uh, again, a project was not built. is uh, is is a fine work. Now we have seen bridges, maybe not so long like this one, but kind of using the same structural system. We just uh, saw one in Rotterdam, the Erasmus Rotterdam, uh, by UN Studio, which is not very different but not so long as this one. Well, you know, this, this uh, techno optimism and this uh, proliferation of interesting structures all over the world, uh, look, at, look, at, look at the quality of the rendering, you know, I mean, <laughs> The reinforced concrete is shown with uh, my, my God uh, the, the, the amount of detail. If I if I am to express myself in this way, if you enter into a competition with uh, the, the office of Zaha Hadid, it's almost impossible to contemplate that you can win. I mean, you know, they the level of sophistication they have in and they, I think they won a competition with this bridge. How, how do you fight with them? It's there are videos with this. You 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 could swear that it was built. It was not built. Now the Iraqi parliament building in Baghdad, which was not built either, 
these are, you know, rather more recent works, closer to the, to, to the time when, when she died. And you can see kind of interesting, you saw the violence, the angular violence of her early work, particularly the peak project. And now you see her, her work is becoming a little more not conventional, but there is an uh, ornamental side to her work, which uh, makes the work a little bit more, less aggressive and, uh, you know, adequate in this case for the function, the parliament of Iraq. So Zaha Hadid has been selected to design the new Iraqi parliament in Baghdad. The controversial decision comes after London-based assemblage was crowned as winner of the competition for the building, which placed uh, Hadid's proposal third. Though a dispute began once the competition's client sparked conversations with Hadid after the winning firm was named, the client stated that the competition rules allow for any shortlisted design proposal to be ultimately chosen for construction. The former RIBA president and competition jury members soon and uh, Prasad backed the client's claim stating, obviously we selected the winner, therefore we'd like to have seen it built, but the client reserved the right to pick any of the top three and they have gone ahead and done that, but it was not built. Now the Qatar stadium, uh, which uh, is, is built, and uh, hopefully next year, if, if the pandemic somehow allows it, uh, it will be uh, used in, uh, for the, you know, uh, soccer games, uh, football games. Uh, there, there was some controversy here too, because many people apparently died, the construction workers, I don't know exactly why, you know, uh, but that was not, the responsibility of uh, Zaha Hadid, that's for sure. It's, it's not because of her that, that uh, you know, uh, poor construction workers, maybe they lived in uh, inadequate uh, conditions. <clears throat> anyway, a, a, remarkable, a remarkable stadium and another remarkable stadium was proposed by her for Tokyo for the, the Olympics of this year and she won the competition and uh, she was sabotaged by the Japanese uh, authorities who gave the, the project to Kengo Kuma. And uh, there was uh, even some uh, litigation. There was uh, uh, Zaha Hadid, uh, her office, uh, they sued, uh, you know, they tried to fight for, the, for getting the, the project built, but they, they didn't succeed. So Kengo Kuma built, uh, you are going to see uh, the project. Now recently completed uh, projects. Uh, it's this one in, uh, in Qatar, <clears throat> the stadium. And uh, you know, uh, how many stadiums in the world are like this? Not many. So, you know, very large public uh, works found in Zaha Hadid, uh, a, skilled, uh, a skilled architect. So maybe next year we are going to see it uh, when, uh, when this championship will start there. Now, Qatar has all the money in the world, so, you know, they afford it to, to build this, uh, you know, rather special uh, stadium and quite big. I don't know if this uh, ornamentation here belongs truly to, uh, it seems rather static. It's possible she here, she compromised a little bit. I don't know, but it's not typical of her work, what we see here at the bottom. Now in London, the gallery at the Science Museum from 2016, she died in 2016. So she died in March. Uh, this is a, you know, like an installation, but she was able to, to build large, very large buildings, but also to, to create works like this one. 
which is essentially interior design. Now, when you see something like this, you would agree with the guardian that she was the queen of the curves. I don't, not all her works are like this. So it, there can be magic in architecture, but in order to arrive at, at that magic, you need to have the tools to be able to, to, to um, you know, express what you want to express in this this way and and if you don't have those tools you simply cannot do it i mean how do you create these kind of surfaces impossible you need to have the technology uh, to do it now here is a, a, another built work Zaha Hadid architects this was done after after she died i think carves out sculptural flood protection barrier in Hamburg, in Germany. Zaha Hadid architect has completed the sculptural uh, Niederhaven uh, river promenade in Hamburg, Germany, as part of the city's upgrade of its flood prevention system. Positioned along the 625 meter long stretch between the streets, it replaces uh, the uh, replaces one of the cities existing but dilapidating flood barriers built in 1964 while providing vital flood defense for the city zaha hadid design also incorporates amphitheater like staircases a, a three story restaurant and shops at street level to offer the city a new public space and uh, uh, riverside walkway so essentially, this is almost, uh, you know, like a landscape uh, uh, design. And uh, I think it's valid, you know, it's, it's not, uh, it's not um, extravagantly overworked. It welcomes people, as you can see here, it was before the pandemic to, you know, lay there and to contemplate the water and the, and the ships. So I think they adapted the work quite well to the to the context and to the function. Now, this was a tower proposed for uh, Fifth Avenue in New York, which was not built from 2017. So she already, she died in 2016. Uh, this is the tower. It was not built. I, I don't know if it will be built or not. Now, um, so let's look at it again. It's uh, surely this, this tower. And now uh, California residence. Uh, so very different from what we saw from uh, Charles Moore and uh, Richard Morris Hunt. Um, I don't know. I think her private residence is, now this might have, I don't know if it was proposed while she was alive or after she died. It's possible during her, her life, uh, I mean, while she was still alive. Um, I don't think her houses or her, yeah, are very intimate. And um, 
you know, they are, they are interesting, of course, in terms of shape, but um, I think they lack intimacy. Something, in my opinion, is missing. I, 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 I looked carefully at the, the, the house she built for that Russian uh, immensely rich man, and uh, it's uh, futuristic, it's extravagant, it's interesting, it's exciting, it's enticing, but there is no intima in intimacy, there is no sense of home, I would say. And, uh, you know, I mean, this building could have been anything, could have been a church or a chapel, it could have been anything, and it's very big. Uh, so, anyway. <clears throat> The Middle East Center at St. Anthony's College in Oxford, UK, it was built, is this work here, of course. And I, I like the fact that Oxford understands that despite the valuable historical buildings they have, they, they need to build in the present and for the present and for the future. So here she is. Uh, building this building uh, in, a, in an old uh, uh, campus. Uh, you know, she didn't change. It's the same Zaha Hadid architecture, uh, expressing a forward-looking, uh, uh, you know, uh, vision and with uh, new materials. Uh, I mean, look here, the masonry wall, and then next to it is the building by Zaha Hadid. I noticed in some other works by her that the glass surfaces she uses, in my opinion, they are rather conventional. I mean, you see it even here, Ghana, the curves, Ghana, the Baroque, uh, you know, uh, formal uh, uh, display of virtuosities and so on. It's uh, in other buildings, the same thing is like uh, the, the, the glass, it didn't work enough on the glass. And then this glass wall is rather banal, you know, it's, it's somehow it's, 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 it has a different spirit. And it's very conventional, I would say. Anyway, the Dubai Opera House, uh, which was not built, but you never know, Dubai might build it uh, after all. Uh, they can, and look at the site plan. Uh, I think this work was done uh, after she died. She taught architecture at the Institute of Architecture in Vienna for a long time, I don't know, 15 years or so. And uh, they published two books with the works of the students. They had the, one is called Total Fluidity and the other one Fluid Totality. And there are a good number of Romanian uh, students there. I have one of the books. And that's why I know what I'm saying. A very skilled in, in, in working with, uh, you know, uh, in a similar way, you know, with curves and, uh, you know, high technology and digital, uh, uh, you know, means, very skillful. I also know there is a Romanian uh, student, uh, she, she studied in Bucharest and then she went to the Zaha Hadid studio in Vienna. Uh, and uh, she told me that uh, when she was going there to, uh, you know, to her classes or to, to the atelier, she thought she was in Romania because out of 30 students, six or seven uh, were talking Romanian. They, they, they were from, from Romania. Anyway, a touch of uh, patriotism here. Uh, 
So the Dubai Opera project, which was not built yet, and it might not be, I don't know. Now the waterfront is Regium, Regium waterfront in Reggio, Italy, another large uh, project. Uh, it's amazing how many projects she did, you know, or they did. Yes. Fluid totality or total fluidity. Now, <laughs> wideness is gone in this model. Dubai financial markets, another large work. Uh, yes, Dubai can afford it. Personally, I think that, that these works are not totally without any possible blame because they are very slick and uh, kind of self-enclosed. I mean, the, the forms, the shapes do extend themselves towards uh, unknown horizons, but there is uh, something about them. They are, they are still kind of object-like. I mean, they are not my opinion, they are not truly communicate. They are not porous enough. And the towers, um, although she built, I think, a very, very elegant tower in Milan, uh, but these towers are um, for my taste. Again, I'm subjective. Too mundane, too slick, uh, too clean, and too well from the perspective of today, considering that I don't think any window there would open, basi basing themselves on, um, you know, uh, a lot of uh, technology in order to pump air, uh, you know, uh, this is Dubai, right? So you need, uh, you need uh, a cool environment, otherwise you'll melt down. And um, well, I don't know. I guess yes, they do have the money, they have the oil, uh, but uh, it's 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 a kind of architecture that, in my opinion, is uh, is a little bit uh, inadequate for our time because it has an uh, optimism that is nourished by uh, huge amounts of money exploiting the the, the oil, uh, and uh, this kind of optimism, I think, uh, today, well, the project is uh, older, it's not from two years ago, but I think uh, certain things, paradigms have, have changed. I don't think today we can, we can propose such an architecture 
uh, with uh, the conviction that she perhaps had when the project was made, or at least uh, her office. Would I want the whole world to look like this? I'm not sure. I'm not sure, and somehow in the much more modest architecture of Charles Moore, uh, at least for some programs, I think there are valuable, uh, positive, uh, you know, uh, qualities there that, that perhaps we should consider seriously. And even the, you know, the Richard Morris Hunt buildings so very different from these buildings, but there is a history there, there is a continuity, there is a tradition, uh, you know, the masonry wall. This, these buildings were supposed to be made with concrete and only concrete and concrete and okay, here we have steel and glass, but so much concrete and we know that the concrete is, is, is polluting the world. So, but again, this was done prior to the crisis that we are in. And uh, how do we replace? How can we continue to build such huge buildings without using, uh, well, in this case, concrete? Um, I, maybe the times are suggesting to us to become more modest and uh, this kind of, uh, you know, uh, complex of buildings which takes, uh, you know, which takes humanity to uh, to the level where it imagines that uh, you know everything is fine. I don't think is 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 proper for our time. But all in all, the experiments of Zaha Hadid and her office are valuable, I think. And you know, she 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 showed, and also I think the even here in this project, you see the 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 flower like um, you know uh, uh, crystallization of the project and it's this is kind of interesting that from the angular aggressivities of her early work to the flower like configuration of, of her more recent works there is a distance and somehow this this uh, ornamental side of her work points in the direction perhaps of uh, feminization of architecture, which is, I think, a, a, a good thing if it happens. If, if we get rid of this excessive slickness, which does bother me, uh, and uh, this, this mundane aspect of her architecture, which, which uh, I hope could be challenged. I mean, in the renderings, it looks fine, you know, but imagine again that you have to man maintain, you know, the slickness of these surfaces, you know, with an army of, uh, you know, modestly paid or underpaid uh, uh, personnel uh, cleaning up. So the architecture seems sublime all the time. But when I see these studies, I think of the words of her partner and now the one who runs the office, the Zaha Hadid Architects Office, uh, Patrick Schumacher, who said, structure and ornament should, uh, should come together. And I agree with it. So there is, as you can see here, the, the, you know, the, the ornament is insinuating itself into the project. So the structure becomes ornament and the ornament becomes structure. And this is uh, shown in, uh, in uh, several uh, newer works uh, by them quite, uh, quite explicitly. Now the Tokyo National Stadium, she won the competition for this uh, important uh, uh, commission, but unfortunately it was not granted to her and it was probably an unfair decision by the Japanese they gave the project to Kengo Kuma, 
this is the project that she did, and I think uh, I think she should have uh, should she should have been allowed uh, to build it. Um, it, it has a, an a heroic quality which connects with the stadium uh, stadiums that uh, Kenzo Tange built um, uh, in Tokyo uh, more than uh, half a century earlier, in fact, around 70 years earlier almost. And uh, I think the project Pakengo Kuma is, uh, although some some praise it for its, uh, in a way, modesty, but but how could you build a, a stadium of this size, which is modest? In its very function and dimensions, it cannot be modest. But I understand, in a way, the the the, the perplexity provoked by a stadium which which uh, seems to be modest. Um, and the paradox uh, that that such a uh, you know so-called modesty would uh, would uh, would give to a to a stadium of such dimensions, but I think the the, the project by Zaha Hadid was superior, and it's very regrettable that it was not built. Even more so when you consider that it was actually he, they, she won the competition; it was the first prize. And it was not built. Uh, uh, this is sad, uh, and it's another injustice to which women creators are subjected to. I don't know if that was the reason why it was, uh, uh, you know, she was not given the commission. She protested. I understood she even sued. Uh, I don't know the Japanese government or the authorities. I don't know what happened with that um, uh, litigation, but all in all her stadium was not built and it was a defeat. But I think her project still stands for uh, the, the incredible courage of this lady, her vision, her skill, uh, you know, ju just, to, just to be able to bring together such a, such a program at uh, this level of, of, of uh, crystallization and this uh, obvious aesthetical coherence is not easy at all. And she did it or they did it because it was a large team working on the project. And uh, it's not the only thing they did, of course. Anyway, we are looking at an aborted project, which could have been built, but it was not. I just noticed this thing, which, is, which surprises me. Is this existent? Because this makes me think of a similar uh, uh, structure, um, you know, uh, at uh, uh, Ranchamp and even at Saint Pierre de Firmini Ver by Le Corbusier. A little structure, but uh, very similar, a little ziggurat near the, the two churches that Le Corbusier built. Well, one after his, he died, uh, Saint Pierre de Firmini Ver, the other one at Ranchamp. Anyway, it's not going to be this, this work. By Zaha. And uh, not, not because of the pandemic. I mean, you know, this kind of incredible uh, gathering of, I don't know, the numbers of, of this huge audience. The flag, the Japanese flag there on the left. <laughs> I don't know if she would have placed it there if she knew that, you know, she would be deprived of the right to build the building. Okay, so let's wish her happy birthday. Uh, and um, what else can we say? Uh, a remarkable architect.